Another sunny spring day. Highs this afternoon in the low 60s to low 70s. Pullman 64, 70 in Lewiston. With partly cloudy skies, expect overnight lows. Didn't she knock? Mm -hmm. She closed the door. Oh. Okay. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Tom Lamar, and I'm the chair of the Moscow City Council Administrative Committee. It's 3 p.m. on Monday, April 14th, and we are getting started. We have a very full agenda, so we're going to move right along. Today, of course, with me is uh, City Council members Wayne Krause and John Weber, and our uh, staff um, supervision is <laughs> led by Gary Reedner, the city supervisor. Um, the first item on the agenda is the approval of the March 24th, 2014 minutes. Second. Okay, we're going to approve those. I am um, uh, entertaining a motion to uh, amend our agenda for today as there's an item that was inadvertently left off it's a presentation and a request by the Lata County Historical Society so moved so yep second. okay we have those people here so I want to make sure that we can add that so we'll add that to the end of the agenda so that'll be um, item number seven and that requires agenda. a good faith reason a good faith reason is that we had it scheduled in for some reason it dropped off our agenda system uh, but uh, Earl and his folks are here today uh, it's a non-controversial topic, and we're just looking for guidance from the council. And not that's, that's my understanding, yes, too. And that's I think fine. That's, that's what we all three understand. Yeah. All right. Great. Okay, so the second item on the agenda is the <clears throat> Moscow Charter School Rental Fee Waiver Request for 2014-2015 School Year Use of the HERC with Dwight Curtis in front of us. Yeah. Well, good afternoon. Um, with me, I have Tony... Bonicelli, he's the principal of the Moscow Charter School. Welcome. Thank and you. they are requesting a rental fee waiver of the use of the HERC. Uh, this is something we've done for several years now. Um, this would be for next school year, 2014-15. And um, typically what we use is half the gym. The other half is open to the public. Um, it has not been an issue with uh, the public in the past or our programs. And uh, for this next year, they are requesting an additional 36 hours. That's, uh, I don't know, it's like 40 minutes a week or every two days or something like that. They've added on the uh, eighth grade into their program. And uh, I don't see that that would be an issue for us either. And also, um, the charter school uh, has a reciprocal arrangement with us if we need to use their facility for programs they would allow us to do that and I don't know if Tony has anything he wants to add or yeah. um, do I need to say my name and address or please? Please. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, okay Tony Bonicelli Moscow Charter School Principal 1723 East F Street uh, this is my second or this is my first year uh, we're heading into the second year and that's why I wanted to figure out all my scheduling and make sure that we went th through the correct motions. Um, again, with like uh, Mr. Curtis said, it's very, it's reciprocal. Uh, you know, if, if at any time they need to use it, we definitely appreciate being able to use the HERC. It's a great facility. We make sure that we have adequate staff that are going to make sure that our, the facility is well taken care of. And so. John, do you have anything? Oh, the only thing I agree with it and, uh, Quite frankly, uh, the uh, movement that we're getting going with ball fields and other areas of uh, younger children, recreation and sporting activity, I think it would behoove us. Mm -hmm. And since it's worked in the fa in the past uh, as well, as Dwight said, I'm I'm in favor. It's exciting to see kids get get active and get physical and have that be a regular part of their education. Yeah, this is, I don't know how many years we've been doing this. It's, uh, I don't know, three, four, five, six, seems quite a while. Eight or nine. And it's great. Yeah, it's that doesn't cause any problem in the HERC and scheduling. Uh, so, yeah. Okay. I appreciate it. Well, let's let's move that forward to the consent agenda then, okay. Gary. We'll thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, the, the second item on the agenda is the uh, community branding issue with Jen Fifner. Uh, she's the assistant to the city supervisor and Gina Trushko, the Moscow Chamber of Commerce Executive Director. Thank you. Hello. Thank you. Good afternoon. 
Um, this is the second time you've heard a report on this particular project. We're looking at the community branding project, and that's a partnership between the city of Moscow, the Moscow Chamber of Commerce, and the University of Idaho. Um, we've reported on this and let you know sometime in March that we'd be bringing back the request for proposals as we look at finding a consultant to help us with this community branding project. Uh, this project would help Moscow to define as a community kind of a definition of who we are and what we want to portray to the many audiences that we have available to us. For instance, tourism issues, uh, recruitment issues, economic development, um, those kinds of things. So um, in your packets was the request for proposals. We also received today a letter from the University of Idaho um, supporting or outlining their commitment of $10,000 uh, to the project to get us going. Um, Part of the request today is to ask for a formal recommendation um, for $10,000 from the City of Moscow, something that we had discussed last month when you presented this earlier, that we would be bringing that forward. Um, yes, I have a comment about that as well. Yes, please. <laughs> um, where we typically would fund this, we do have flexibility in the legislative budget, non-prioritized projects. We have $22,000 that was budgeted by the council last year. Out of that $22,000, the council has verbally committed $2,500 to uh, the Palouse Knowledge Corridor um, being the entrepreneur boot camp. Um, which leaves it in 195. Um, the reason it was typically that uh, line item is budgeted around 10,000 to 14,000 dollars, depending upon uh, things that the council thinks they might come up throughout the year. Uh, this year it was for to assure that we had sufficient funds to uh, purchase some farmers market banners. Uh, I've talked to Tyler a little bit about the cost, the expected cost of those. Uh, still milling around, but it looks like those will be around $16,000. We do have some other funding that we might be able to tap for that. Uh, if $10,000 were to be uh, allocated out of the um, non-prioritized projects and that would leave about $9,500 in there uh, to go toward that banner type program. We also have uh, some money in strategic planning that hasn't been tapped this year, at least not very much. So there's sufficient flexibility. Uh, from the council's comments uh, or committee's comments a couple of weeks ago, um, they indicated that they would uh, look toward matching the University of Idaho's commitment of $10,000, which is why we're bringing that to you today. Wayne, how much out of strategic planning? How much is left? Yeah. I suspect there will be $15,000 or maybe a little more. It depends how much strategic planning we get done uh, toward the end of this year in accordance with the council's goals. My understanding was we wanted to get this strategic planning process completed this year so we could start moving into doing that next year. Don't we need all that money to do that? Well, actually, we will be reproposing funding in the FY 2015 budget because we don't, we'll probably have some preliminary costs, but we won't start the official planning process until after October 1st and the beginning of the FY 2015 budget which is what we presented in the goal setting. It'll be this calendar year, but it'll be in next budget year. And this $50,000, this is strictly to hire the consultant? Oh. Yes, sir. 50000 in the proposal. The overall right. project. Right. right. Yes. So okay. there would have to be 30000 beyond the city and the university. And that 30000 is coming from the chamber? Yes, sir. Our okay. tourism grant. Um, I think we're all in the wrong business. <laughs> well, that's, no, I, I, you and I are thinking the same way. I mean, I'm thinking like, how long is this going to take to get this, this get this consulting firm on board? I mean, oh, a year. year? To so get the consulting firm on board, we're looking at reviewing the proposals or the re responses to the request for proposals the first week of May, um, and then identifying a consultant within the month. The project itself, I don't think, will take. Um, more than a year total from starting from where we're at now and we even began meeting on this in January. Mm -hmm. um, but also looking at making sure we have a good public input process so the community is involved, doing some surveys, doing uh, those kinds of things. We've asked that specifically to be called out in any response that any consultant makes because we think that's a really important part of this process. So that would take some time as well. Okay. So we're looking at a process that takes us through next January or next April, do you think? 
you're saying a year, a year from now or a year from January when you started working on it? No, sir. I believe it could be next April. Next April, okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, it, consultant comes in, works with people, gets input from various groups and individuals, and there's probably some kind of public presentation or engagement or something like that. And right. We'll hear a lot more about this yes. as it goes. Mm -hmm. There is also the implementation strategy as well. So it's the development or the, or the data gathering, the development of, and then an implementation process for um, this branding. Right. Mm -hmm. it, is, it is a fairly comprehensive um, investment, not just 30000 for the, the 50. 50,000 for the gentleman to come in the door. Mm -hmm. right. He brings lots of. He's bringing us a turnkey operation, of, essentially. I, I, yes. Would hope. I would hope. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, well, we've talked about this before and we yeah. expressed interest yeah. and we're still at interested. that same level, so I think we're still. Well, and, yeah, and we've got the university commitment, we've got the chamber commitment. So I guess it's still, we're still there. Are we still there with our town? Foot on there. Okay. <laughs> on prioritized projects? Yep. I think that's okay. probably the best place right now. Don and I keep a running tab on non-prioritized projects. <laughs> and there he is over there keeping the tab up as we speak. Yeah. <laughs> All right. On that subject of keeping the tab, and, and could could Don send us an email just to, so we know where we're at on non-prioritized non budget? Absolutely. That. We will make that happen. All right. I think we can. Consent it. Thank you. Yes, I think yeah. we can Excellent. do that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. All right, um, number four, um, educational assistance policy revision with Debbie Klein-Robertson, our the City Human Resources Director. Good afternoon. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, the item under review here is the educational assistance policy. It's part of our personnel policies. It provides uh, educational assistance to full-time employees. And um, there's a number of... Uh, changes recommended here. Most of them are clarifying in nature. The more significant change involves having uh, the city supervisor rather than the department heads approve um, recommendations for, uh, for uh, educational assistance. And uh, essentially this will provide better tracking <coughs> of the overall educational assistance program as well as better budget budgetary controls. Can you give us an example of an educational assistance action or a, you know the, an example of the policy being implemented where the, the city supervisor is given some permission and what happens? As far as, as just as an example, so like uh, what kind of education? An employee, no just for, yeah, exactly. One kind of education, just because we have people. Well, I guess most audience. currently there's been interest in getting a master's in public administration. So the request would go through the through the supervisor and the department head, and then the request would come to the city supervisor for final approval as far as the necessity to the organization for. Um, the program, whether you know, obviously benefits the. Right. So the employee is asking to further improve their skill set Skills, and is education. asking for education mm -hmm. to yes. figure out how to make that happen. Okay, thanks. John? Um, if I'm not mistaken, uh, after uh, I was elected and before uh, I started serving, didn't we have a group of uh, our people with the, either the water department or the street department? that had all done the road scholar program mm -hmm. yes yeah those those programs you've got your call them vocational professional technical programs uh, for instance the international city county management association i attend uh, the water folks attend the american public work or i guess that'd be the the uh, city engineer and the mm -hmm. public works director go to the American Public Works Association, Bill Belknap goes to the Planning Association folks. That that technical professional education is different than this. Okay. This is additional um, community college or college credit, correspondence type credit uh, that is meant to further your education, your professional <coughs> education uh, um, toward a certificate or toward a uh, additional degree. Uh, we It's been utilized in the past. We see extensive use of it in the police department uh, because of the agreement with the University of Idaho that our police officers are able to take classes at a reduced rate 
Uh, we have several police officers in the past who have uh, achieved masters of public administration or political science degrees up there. And so we're reimbursing them as long as they, number one, can show that it benefits the, their work at the city, benefits the city. And two, they have to have a passing grade and they have to be on a track to complete some sort of <coughs> certificate or, or degree. And so what happens then is they request reimbursement through their department head and then through my office. Wait. What do you, what do we ask for as far as um, a guarantee from them on continued employment? It's a one year that you have to, if you leave prior to the expiration of one year, then you are responsible to pay the city back the cost of that education. Just one year? Yes. Yeah, because Mike, that's my concern is, is is we're reimbursing them for furthering their education, making them, of course, more valuable to us, mm -hmm. but at the same time more qualified to move on to another position within another city, another type of employment, and so we lose that. And so I and, and this has been debated over the years whether <laughs> there is an advantage to the city itself, and it's been determined that it is. It takes a longer time to get a degree when you're fully employed. You're not taking 12 to 16 credits per semester. Typically, you're taking one, two classes. Um, professional, uh, like an MPA, typically is about 30 to 34 credits, something like that. So it's going to take you a while to do that. So someone who's coming here, utilizing that as a benefit and then moving on, it's going to take them three, four, maybe five years to achieve that, whereas if they did it themselves, they might be able to do it in 18 months to two years. And so then we're asking for that one-year obligation after they've completed it and received their degree. Yes. Okay. I think it's terrific. We've got employees that are excited about furthering their education and continuing to work here. It's a good thing. Are you the one that requested this, or were you? was it asked of other We've had, uh, department uh, heads saying, hey, I need some... No, it hasn't been utilized uh, extensively. Like I said, in the police department, it has been because of the reduced cost. But I've had several employees who've indicated that they may have an interest. So in order, to, as Debbie said, in order to make sure that we have some budgetary control over it, there may be additional policies that come out um, regarding how does that affect our, our uh, professional training budgets or professional um, what do we call it now? Not professional training. Professional development. What? Development. Professional development. As Don tells me, dogs are trained, humans are developed. So that's <laughs> what we're doing. Um, so in our professional development, how much of that will be the academic type <coughs> training versus the uh, professional um, certification type training? One last Wayne. question. Yep. Prior to this change then, it was the department head that okayed it. The way it was written is the department had approved and then it was reviewed in my office. And then I would look it over to make sure that it met all those requirements. We've also increased, I've talked to a couple of the folks who wanted to pursue uh, further education. We're asking for a more rigorous uh, application type process and, and uh, monitoring them throughout their degree. So how has this changed then? If this, is, is the department super, supervisor still has to give their okay or not? It's it's just flipped now. It has to be reviewed by the department head, and the department head can uh, submit comments. For instance, if it is a degree or it's professional training that doesn't appear to the department head that it will benefit the city, then that still can come to me, but the department head will have the opportunity to weigh in on that. Sounds good. All right, well, I'm Pri prior to you getting it? Yes. Okay. I'm That's fine good. with the change in the policy, I think. Yep. Yeah. Too? Anytime anyone wants further education, <clears throat> I think it's a good idea. So, okay. All right. Okay. Thank you. That can go to consent to agenda, consent agenda, agenda. Too, if you like. Yeah. yeah, that'd be great. Thanks, Deb. Item number five, bicycles on sidewalks. Les McDonald. Good afternoon. This is Don Meyer. Don is the chair of the Transportation Commission. Yay, yeah, thank you. This year, so a new role for Don. Um, bicycles on sidewalks. This is something that the Transportation Commission has discussed on numerous occasions over the past two, three, four, or five years, actually. And uh, it did come to this group 
back in November of last year uh, with a request from the Transportation Commission to get some guidance from the council as to whether or not this is something the city should be delving into a little further to somehow address what are becoming much more common complaints about bicycles on walks in the downtown business district. Um, obviously, we've seen um, a number of incidents over the years, a lot of anecdotal information certainly that has come through, people concerned about you know, bicyclists that either come too close to them on the sidewalk or traveling too fast on the sidewalk, uh, maybe get in the way of doors that are opening, just in, in some respects creating some kind of disturbance uh, within the business district itself. So uh, we came to this commission or this committee back in November and the direction that was given to transportation was to yes please take a look at this and come back to the committee with some suggestions if you have any about what we could do as a city. So the Transportation Commission has been working on this and uh, have some recommendations. So that's why we're here today is to show you what those are. And I will say first off that thank you, Tom. Um, he pointed out that the attachment that was in your packet was actually an older version. I had an outdated one, unfortunately. Uh, so as um, we get started, I'd like to go ahead and send around the correct later version. Is dated March 19th rather than <coughs> February 13th, two pages instead of one. The commission approached this matter um, really in, in a couple of ways, taking a look at how best to address the issue. I mean, first off, was there really an issue? How big of an issue was it? Uh, and then how best to address it. And the conclusion generally was that yes, based on everybody's experience and history, that it was believed that there was a bit of a problem related to this. Not all bicycles on the sidewalks downtown are problematic, but there are some that do create an issue. There was also a desire, and I think it was also expressed by um, this committee, that applying some kind of a, you know, an ordinance or a regulatory perspective was not really the first desired option. Uh, it was, you know, let's find some other way than posting the sign that says, you know, bikes on prohibited on sidewalks ordinance and other such and such. There was really a desire to avoid that, and the commission uh, bought into that wholeheartedly and tried to identify ways that could be uh, achieved uh, that would be much more friendly, uh, more encouragement, educational outreach type approach. So the recommendations uh, that they are bringing forward um, really follow that, that thought. Let's not start with an ordinance. Let's start with an outreach effort that encourages people to not ride their bicycles on downtown sidewalks. But also to go further than that and say, you know, don't do it in a negative perspective. Don't say dismount zone. Mm -hmm. Do it in the perspective of please walk your bikes. Mm -hmm. A more positive message. You know, and really trying to convey that this is a, on the sidewalks downtown, is a primarily a pedestrian zone. So let's please treat it as such. If you want to ride your bike on the bike, you know, ride your bicycle on the sidewalk, it is permissible, it is allowed, but we're encouraging you either to not do that or if you do need to ride, ride on Main Street. Okay? It's a slow volume, fairly low traffic, uh, low, slow speed, fairly low traffic volume street, and so riding on Main Street really is generally not problematic for mm -hmm. most bike riders. Obviously, if you've got a, you know, four-year-old on a bicycle, keep them on the sidewalk. Mm -hmm. But you know, for everybody that's older, you know, it's easy enough to ride down Main Street. So the recommendations um, that are in the, in the package that, that they're bringing forward are, first off, set the goal to encourage the bicyclists to either ride on Main Street or to walk their bikes uh, while they're on the sidewalks. Trying, of course, to um, limit the conflicts that we've experienced down in the downtown core. The area we're talking about really would be starting out really just Main Street between First Street and Sixth Street. So it's kind of that downtown central business section where we have the greatest pedestrian activity and the greatest potential for conflict between a bicycle and a pedestrian on the sidewalk. They have proposed at the commission uh, a couple of things. Um, one is, actually I'll jump to the second one, which is to post some signage and potentially to paint some signage on the sidewalks. So you'd have some of the typical signs that you would normally see uh, posted somewhere in the system, but also 
uh, put some thought of doing some things on the sidewalks themselves. If you look on the second page, you'll see an example of one of the on-sidewalk type treatments. Uh, essentially, it's, you know, it can take many forms, but this is one example uh, that was identified off of a website. And really, the idea is that you know, when you're riding a bicycle in your downtown, what are you looking at? If you're on the sidewalk, you're not necessarily looking up for signs. You may be looking for pedestrians and doors and you know, benches and things of that nature, looking at the sidewalk to see if there's any you know, cracks that you're going to run into, things like that. So you may be perhaps more likely to see something at ground level that's applied to the sidewalk you know, on the edges of the downtown district. So a combination of perhaps something on the ground similar to this and some form of signage um, that would convey to folks that, you know, please walk your bicycle when you're in the, on the, in the business district on the sidewalks. To help encourage folks to then use the street if they still need to ride or prefer to ride if they're passing through or trying to go several blocks, something of that nature, um, the commission has proposed that we use something called a shero, which is an arrow that includes a bicycle symbol, so it's supposed to convey the shared use. So it's arrow and shared, so sharrow is how they come about. Uh, we'd be painted on the street, uh, on Main Street, most likely out towards the center line uh, to get away from the parked cars. There's a little bit of concern about if we're encouraging bikes on Main and we have diagonal parking, mm -hmm. you know, is the driver backing out going to be able to see that bicycle up there if they're up tight against the parked cars? That's a bit of an issue. So if we can encourage folks to crowd the center line a little bit, give a little more space for reaction and visibility, um, that certainly helps. Again, speeds are low. Actually, the bikes may actually exceed the speed of the cars in many <laughs> cases. Um, but that would be a thought is to paint some sharrows there as well. These items in combination would put the symbols out there to help convey to people coming into the downtown that you know, you can, it's okay to ride in the street, it's a shared facility, you know, please don't ride on the sidewalk you know, with that encouragement. And then there would be an out, outreach educational type activity. And, and what's being proposed is there is a uh, bike to work day on May 16th of this year. And the commission uh, really is, um, likes the idea of trying to essentially have everything in place by the time we reach that date and make that day one of education where we can reach out to the folks that are biking. We're saying, hey, you know, come on down, come downtown. You know, here's the new system that's in place. Encourage you to walk your bikes on the sidewalk, but ride in the street. It's marked for that all the various things that go with that. One of the ideas that, uh, that was also floated out there is when we get to that point uh, on a farmer's market day on one of the Saturdays, we can place a shero in the street, start putting them on the ground just before this date, and do something as simple as putting a sign out with an arrow that points down to the shero and says, what is this? And the idea is to get people's attention. They would look at it, what is that? Well, you know, see the educational outreach, here's the flyer, here's the, the table, somebody nearby that can say, well, here's what it is and here's what it means. You know, to try to reach out to all those folks that are walking up and down Main Street during the market to see that shero and understand what it is, not only from a, a pedestrian and vehicular, or excuse me, bicycle perspective, but from a vehicular perspective. Because those people are going to be driving down that street on another day, they'll see that shero, they'll think about what they saw, mm -hmm. and they'll understand what it's there for. And so they'll know to watch for bicycles that we're now encouraging on Main Street. So that's the concept. Um, again, the idea of an ordinance could be brought back at some point in the future if this type of effort is not successful in discouraging the use of bikes on, on the sidewalks downtown. Um, the commission's recommending we put something like, like this in effect and let it run about a year, gauge the success of the program, and then either continue it as is or, if need be, make modifications as appropriate. And Don's certainly here to help answer questions if you have any or if there's anything you'd like to add. Yeah. How did uh, how did the Transportation Commission rectify the problem of young kids? Let's, let's, let's go back to a parent and a four-year-old. Okay. Okay. We don't want the four-year-old out in the street. This is not an educational <coughs> process for young kids. Yet the parent's not allowed to ride on the, bi on the sidewalk. So... Hmm. I know when I was when I was your liaison, there were some discussions as to how to rectify this particular problem. Or, <coughs> excuse me, we go to 10-year-olds that are on their own, not so sure we want 10-year-olds out in the street. Maybe we do. I don't. That, my question is, how did the Transportation Commission come up with a solution for that problem? 
Uh, I don't know that we actually came up with a solution per se, but I think the feeling was that um, a lot of folks that have children that age are going to be towing them behind their bikes in one of those little cart type things that they hook up to the bicycle or that they're going to have them in uh, some type of a, a car seat type thing that you can you can clamp onto a bicycle uh, so I guess the feeling was that we thought that problem may or may not be a problem as far as the kid you know because the parents would just dismount and would still pull the kids along in whatever conveyance they were in less i guess the other thing to think about in that perspective is you know if, if you are riding downtown with a four-year-old on a bicycle your speed is going to be very low and generally speaking that is not the biker that is creating an issue in the downtown core I mean, if you're if you're riding with your four-year-old and you're you know puttering along on the sidewalk, I don't think many people are going to have a lot of problem with that. It's it's the older kids that are getting the speed, mm -hmm. and there's just not time to react. That that I think is that's why I brought conflict. up issue of like a like a ten-year-old. Yeah, and a ten-year-old you may run into that, and you know most ten-year-olds anymore will go anywhere yeah. uh, on a bicycle, and so uh, if they choose to go down Main Street again, it's a, a low speed, you know, fairly low volume situation. So, should be a reasonable place to ride. Um, you know, if they're going to take higher speed down the sidewalk, they may. Yeah. John, I uh, I agree with the approach here, and uh, in a partial response uh, to Wayne's question, uh, we were talking, or you were talking about an educational process, and it could be as simple as see this sign from here. We walk. Dad or mom gets off the bike, and they walk. And as you also said, with 10-year-olds, uh, 12-year-olds, they're going to go where they're going to go. And uh, we could, with them, it's, it's kind of like putting um, uh, tags on cats. <laughs> you know, <laughs> they're going to go where they're going to go. It doesn't make any difference. But as, as far as an approach to sharing the street, uh, I think uh, we have come full circle which is good in that uh, it started out a number of years ago that uh, drivers were told that there are bicycles out here, share the road with them. And now we're doing the same thing with the bicycles. There are pedestrians out here, share the road with them. And in Moscow, I don't know that we need, I agree, I don't know at this point that we need an ordinance at all. I think uh, most of the people in in our community uh, are going to listen they're going to pay attention they look out for each other and those that don't well they're going to have to be dealt with in a different way well I, I and i i appreciate this coming forward and i i appreciate the work that the transportation has done uh, transportation commission has done on this uh for the past bunch of months on this um i i of course, as everybody knows, ride ride a bike. I ride a bike a lot. Um, I th I've had some complaints. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that um, probably the most, uh, and I do recognize that there are a lot of anarchy bicyclists around, sure. um, and they come around corners, and suddenly they're right in front of you, and it's not it's not comfortable. Um, I think both of these uh, pieces of signage are going to be important, both the ones that are in the street and the ones in the sidewalk. I. Um, personally believe that the sharrows um, in the street either going down first or simultaneously um, w will help to uh, pull people into the street um, as a as an intentional this is where we want you to ride your bike and I think that's a, an important um, either simultaneous step or first step and then I think it's important to also then put the pieces down on the sidewalk because I think you know and the, and the two together will m be a clear message of here you need to go at pedestrian speeds and that makes the most sense if you're walking your bike and here you can ride your bike like you're riding a bike and I think it'll be really helpful if we can pull those um, the bikes out into the street where they should be um, that's where I ride um, and I think that um, 
I, I'd also like the idea of moving those sharrows towards the center line um, on Main Street. I think it's a very, it's a very much a make sense place for bikes to be in this uh, first through six. I would actually probably suggest that that's where bikes should be all the way down to probably um, down at the end of where the hospital is because it it pretty much is uh, given the configuration of the parking up and down Main Street. Um, and, and this that's could the place for, sure the time, but sure. This, it was a starting point. Oh, I think it's great, and and I think that I think having having the shows down, having the the markings on the sidewalk are really going to help to say better here than there. I mean, that's really the message we're trying to get to people. And I think if we, and, and shares are showing up in so many other cities around the country that people are getting it pretty quickly. And I was back in D.C. Um, with both the mayor and the city supervisor uh, in March, and we saw some really good examples of the use of sharrows and bike lanes and some other things that were being used very actively by, well, tourists and commuters alike. And I think people are getting it. And I think, you know, we have a lot of students at the University of Idaho that come here from Boise and other towns in, in the state um, that have some of these designs. So it's nice to be able to use those here too so I, th I think it's a good and, I think and it's these a good way on, to do it on shows this would be our first installation in the community but there are others in our future mm -hmm. you know, as, sure. as, as we're looking at the you know more defined bike route system which also is something else transportation has been working on a, a, a series of you know greenway streets shared use streets uh, bicycle uh, lanes things of that nature we are going to be bringing forward more of this type of thing throughout the system. Sure, Sixth Street west of um, uh, the power plant, where there's no uh, bike lane, or I guess west of the sub, it's where there's like no that, certainly right, where there's no bike lane on one side, mm -hmm. but you still mm -hmm. want people to ride on the correct side of the road and not against traffic on the other side. So yeah, that makes sense. I, th I think it's a great. Yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah, sounds like an idea. Back when it was first addressed on transportation commission. Uh, I think it's a good, it's going to be a good uh, project to move forward with and uh, see how it works out. I, one of the other things that I think is going to be a benefit is that uh, I've always felt that Main Street needed to have some traffic calming, and I think bicycles, sharing it with, with vehicles, will act to a point of more That's traffic calming. I just hope we don't get too many situations where we have some bicyclists going down the middle of the street at five miles an hour holding up traffic behind them because that could get some people kind of aggravated. So everybody has to kind of give and take on it. But I think it's going to be a good program. I won't be gone five. No, you never do. <laughs> Ask me one more time, I'm going to open my door. <laughs> Thanks. I, Gary, I think we can move this forward to consent. Okay. Thank, Thank, Thank you. Thank you Thanks, so much. Um, number six, uh, update to the per diem rates for the city of Moscow. Don Palmer. <clears throat> Good afternoon. Um, it's been over 10 years since we last updated the per diem rate, and as we're moving into the 2015 budget, it would be a good idea to revisit this. Um, our current per diem rates are $39 a day, and that was, like I said last time we've done that, was 10 years ago. I had Henry Ann pull up um, what our experience has been over the last um, last year and the average was over $46 um, by the employees. Um, and so also uh, I had uh, done some research on some other what other cities do in terms of per diem rates. And my recommendation is to use the uh, government uh, GSA, which is the U.S. General Services Administration, um, as, their, as a guideline, kind of like what we do with our mileage for reimbursements for um, the Internal Revenue Service. So it's a good index to use. Currently it's set at $46 in, in Idaho. There are a few counties in Idaho that are more than that, like Coeur d'Alene uh, area is $61. Um, Boise is still 46 but Sun Valley is 71 which would be the, the highest. I don't anticipate anybody going there, but, but uh, except maybe Gary. He's got a uh, actually going there this fall. Yeah, Thanks, you've Tom. got uh, the <laughs> city managers uh, meeting there. Only the only top of the line stuff. 
<laughs> so anyway, um, it's my recommendation to use that as an index. That's a ton. And uh, for the most part, we've had a number of employees that um, are that do not have access to credit cards um, be reimbursed, and instead of so they get their per diem, and then find out that w their destination is higher than the thirty nine dollars. So uh, GSA's website does provide provisions, though, for if the actual expenditures are more than the $46. For example, there are certain um, conference hotels where the rates aren't, aren't, aren't conducive to the rates. Um, so anyway, that's, that's a recommendation I would use. And uh, if you have any, I'd entertain any comments that you guys might have about it. Questions, John? Well, no question, but just comment. We're going from 39 to 46 is your suggestion? Correct. Uh, that is essentially uh, the amount of a tip for breakfast, a tip for lunch, and almost stiffen them on dinner. So uh, I, don't, I don't have a problem with this. I don't particularly like it, but... Uh, what don't you like? Well, just... You're not enough? Would have higher? No, I'm just spending money. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, we don't, we don't reimburse for tips anyway. If we don't, we should. Actually, our policy is that we do reimburse in with uh, current policy, I believe, is 15%. That was when we passed, the council passed our last reimbursement uh, specifically because it's a service-based. Uh, it was part of our uh, general discussion about a living wage and the fact that food service professionals don't typically make minimum wage they have since they get some of their income from tips that it was determined by the council that we wanted to make sure that uh, tips were covered in accordance with with general policy a question for Don sure. um, the um, these this proposed rate of $46 a day um, stands even if the employee is in traveling to Coeur d'Alene or um, Sun Valley as you said where no. The costs are higher. Is that what you're saying? No. What I'm saying is that there's provisions with GSA's website that they identify certain counties or cities, cities within those counties, where they would pay the higher rate. And my recommendation would be to follow that as well. So, I see. for okay. example, okay. if we have an employee that goes to Coeur d'Alene, then the per diem rate would be 61. Okay. Mm. And likewise, the GSA has zones around Boston, for instance, I think was $71, whereas the rest of Massachusetts is 46 correct? Correct. So, so it's, it's, it's localized as to where um, they see those higher costs being the standard. Mm -hmm. So rather than just it, it, the intent, of course, is to make sure that, um, you know, the employees are able to to live there for the time that they're there on professional business. So, and this is the, the standardized rate that makes the most sense for our employees to track that, those rates. Right. Okay, thanks. How do you, I'm assuming that it's $46 per day and that's assuming that the employee has been at that city for the entire day. As an example, they fly in at 3 o'clock in the afternoon and so they only have one meal, but the $46 doesn't count. It's and the way that's administered is, say you go to Boise and you get in at, at uh, 6. Say you get on the flight at 8.30, 8 o'clock, you're not going to get breakfast for that day, but a luncheon and if you're there overnight, of course, supper and breakfast the next day. So actually the department heads are very good and the employees are very good about saying, okay, this is when I would normally be eating a meal while I'm on the road or not on the road. So um, you don't see that abused at all okay good i think this yep. does this work for you you too sure does. Oh, I'm fine okay with it. Yeah. all right yeah, i think i think this sounds good for all three of us and so we should as well to the consent yeah okay yeah. thank you very much thank you okay we okay can take a five minute recess sir and i there was sure. some backup that earl and his folks okay. provided I'd like to give you a chance to read that oh yeah okay so sure. we go into recess then he will go into recess and we will come out in five minutes okay that should be plenty. Which Thank is three forty nine on my watch.
All right. She will still not. She's not. There you go. Okay. Uh, it is now 3.49, and we are reconvening the Moscow City Council Administrative Committee on April 14th, 2014. Um, we're going to uh, jump to reports. Uh, Gary's going to get that out of the way um, while we're waiting for Bill Belknap to walk over here. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I was giving a report on the extension of our amendment to the 2003 Solid Waste Franchise Agreement. Uh, this was passed by the City Council on April 15th of 2013 uh, due to largely my screw-up. It was never signed by the Mayor. It's effective, but the document has not been executed. So I wanted to report to the Council that uh, we're rectifying that and that will be signed, but it's been in effect for the year, so it's a matter of bookkeeping. But I just wanted to give a quick report on that and let you know that um, that you'll see that in our filing system. Well, that's fun. Yeah. No big change. So um, while Bill is on his way, if you want to go ahead and have Earl and his folks present. That would be great. So item number seven um, is this proposal before us to establish uh, a city historian program for Moscow, Idaho. And the proposal is coming to us from the Latak County Historical Society. Yes, indeed. Thank you very much for Thank you. having us this afternoon. We uh, have I'm Earl Bennett here, and he's going to introduce Bennett. himself. I'm the president of the Historic Society, and I'd like to introduce Dulce Kirsting, who's the relatively new director of the Historical Society, and Zach Wenick, who's the new curator. So they're all, except for me, they're all new. Okay. Uh, I won't belabor it. You have the proposal in front of you. Uh, we have been working for about four years on establishing uh, city historians throughout Latah County, and Moscow's the last one. Uh, and there's a good reason for that. Uh, we have a Historic Preservation Commission uh, that we wanted to go through first, see if it was something they might want to take on. We have met several times with them now. And uh, their decision has been they'd like to be involved as far as having input on whatever kind of products we produce, but they're not particularly interested in doing the overall job. And really, they're, what they're set up to do is not what we're proposing. Uh, you heard about rebranding. Uh, I don't know how you rebrand anything without uh, a big historical content in it. Uh, when they start to do that, we know where they're going to come because we have the main archive for Moscow already just up the street at our, at our office. So we really are already doing what is required of a city historian. I won't go into all that. You have the bullets in front of you. The um, city of Moscow used to support Latai County Historical Society many years ago, and nobody's quite sure exactly what happened. My guess is budget hits came in somewhere along the line, and that's what happened. Uh, the little gizmoid on the back here, which is called a, a QR code, is not a new thing. But it's something, for example, as an example of what we can do with our with the new folks that we've got on board. Uh, if you're interested in downtown preservation, for example, it's it can be very expensive. And as you know, everybody on this council has wrestled with some aspect of downtown historic preservation for on for many occasions. Uh, what we're proposing is not putting lots of dollars into brass plaques and so on on all of our historic buildings, but putting this in the window of it. Anybody with a smartphone then can, just like you, some of you have done, can scan that and we can put any kind of historic content on that particular building right on it. The cost of this compared to brass plaques and all the other normal ways you would do this is very small. Uh, one of the other reasons we're making that pitch is we've got a lot of this data already in hand. There's no doubt about it. It's simply a matter of putting it in format. Uh, we mentioned that Jenna and the Chamber would be involved with us on this, perhaps, in selecting which parts of downtown we would do first. This is just one example. So that's kind of the thing that we're looking at. And uh, the that's first cool. sentence has it all in line for you there. We're willing to act, the Latah County Historic Society is willing to act as a city historian for the city of Moscow. Uh, and this is not unheard of. The J.K. Heritage Foundation is the city historian for Juliet and Kendrick. So it's, we have precedent there. Mm -hmm. uh, and in return, we would ask to go back to something like we used to do where the Moscow, uh, Moscow puts in uh, $5,000 a year into the Historic Society's budget. That would be renewable by both agencies on an annual basis, just like many of the folks that, that you deal with. 
So from that, uh, I want the, the first question I want to answer is one that is not addressed in here, and I apologize for that because I should have done it. And as Wayne brought it up at the Preservation Commission meeting, his question was, so how much work is, are the city employees going to be involved with, with this particular proposal? And our answer is right now, none that we're aware of unless the city decides they want to do something along these lines that will require some kind of input from your employees. But that would be your decision to do, not ours. So we're not going to go immediately to the city, you know, to the city clerk and start beating on her for all kinds of information about buildings and so on. That's not the purpose of the exercise. With that, uh, we've already done the demo. You've already seen that it works. Uh, we will also have a new written brochure that covers the downtown district with numbers on these little things that relate to the, the paper copy for the folks that aren't in the smart smartphone world yet. <laughs> and as far as the gizmoid itself, you don't need to worry about it being replaced. It doesn't make any difference what replaces it. It's simply a matter of putting up another little piece of paper in every window that's got the new gizmoid on it and it ties right into the same database that we're using for this one. This is a, a fancy version of a barcode. It's the updated version of barcodes. With that, I think I'm there. One of the Here questions I asked Earl to address, and I don't know that you have yet, and that is what the difference is between our uh, Historical Preservation Commission and what the city historian would do. Thank you. I think when people we might had, have that question. Yeah, when we had the discussion, and Earl's exactly right, it was a budgetary situation that uh, the funding for the Latah County Historical Society um, was cut. It uh, was a funding issue, and uh, at that time, the city council seated at that time uh, thought that the city's historical needs were met by the Historic Preservation Commission. So um, Earl's indicated he could address that, and certainly we'd be happy to hear that. And I think most of that is in this paragraph here that says cooperation with the Moscow Historic mm -hmm. Preservation Commission, which is towards the end of it. Um, their mission is different than ours. They are not historians. They're preservationists. We have some overlap. They're very interested in, because they are interested in preservation, you can't do preservation without understanding the history of it. Our request to them will be, for example, on buildings, is the architectural style of, and that kind of content for the buildings that we don't cover. And they're more, more than willing to do that. So uh, this will be a <coughs> partnership type of arrangement, if you will, but they do not wish to serve as a historian. It really is outside the, the main uh, framework of what their organization does. Just like we would not be involved with orchids and onions as far as preservation goes within the, within the city. I asked Bill okay. Belknap to come over as liaison or his staff as liaison to the Historic Preservation Commission if he has anything to add to the discussion. Bill, would you be able to come up and address it from the Historical Commission's point of view? Good afternoon. Thanks. Yes, uh, Earl present to the Commission I think at their April 3rd meeting of this month and the Commission in general is very supportive of the proposal uh, the Commission does serve a very different function and role and has kind of that uh, turnover and don't and really don't have the longevity that the Historical Society has to have an individual point of contact be that city historian so they felt the services that would be provided by the Historical Society were very complementary to what <coughs> the Commission does and the Commission was generally supportive of the concept thank you as the uh, liaison for a historical commission, uh, I'd like to report that they are enthused about, uh, the commission itself is enthused about partnering with Latah County Historical Commission uh, in, in putting this program together. The way it had originally come out, came to the historical commission, they weren't very excited about doing it uh, because it was out of their purview. It wasn't something that they was felt was in within their mission statement, but uh, as this has progressed, and as Earl explained at that April 3rd meeting, uh, it does look like something that would, would work pretty well. Uh, one thing I did want to mention, Earl, is you did make comments about brass plaques on buildings. And uh, assuming, or if we do go along with this, your pieces of paper on the windows will not be taking the place of those brass plaques because the historical commission has already budgeted and purchased and will be installing these these plaques which are very nice and they will enhance the buildings as long as the owners are willing to have them installed actually 20 of those are being installed today and they're important well, to today today, today. Uh, they're actually important go. to signify 
and recognize the building itself, but you can only right. put so much information on a Absolutely. plaque. Absolutely. And so I think that's where the QR codes can supplement the plaques. Plaques help recognize the, the building and then having a source of additional information to understand the history and more specific information about the building is a good pairing. Uh, John, did you have any? I just, uh, I think the dollar amount is very, very reasonable, and we've got two young people here that appear to be willing to uh, take on the job, and then the uh, Lataw County Historical Society has done a tremendous amount of work up to this point. Um, at this point, it's been for a number of years uh, Unpaid, and so uh, if we kick in five thousand dollars to help with their budget, um, I think that's a, a good expenditure of the city's money, and it will also give some perspective to things that have happened in town uh, previous. I'm older than dirt, so I remember it all. <laughs> but <laughs> thanks, John. Gary, yeah, not being asked today to approve the program. This is informative, as I indicated earlier. We will proceed to um, have it uh, presented in the budget, which we okay. are beginning to move through now. Um, so it's not something that we budgeted for this year. So it's not something we can do until October 1st at any rate. Okay, so we're not talking about an expenditure before October 1st. Okay. I think I mentioned that too, didn't I? Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, well, one of the I, th I think it also sounds like a, a, a great idea. And I, one thing that I really like about this is is that the the Lata County Historical Society has um, has a building right over there, and it's it's nice and close and accessible, and it, it kind of expands the um, having a more formal relationship. I think would expand that that opportunity for gathering that information and. and you know, sending people to, well, go talk to our historian that's right there two blocks over and one block up. So I think it's a nice way to um, to implement this. Okay. So I'd like to see it move forward. So Okay, we will have it brought through the budget process. Okay, we'll do that then. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank Thanks you. for being here. You wouldn't do that for 2000 do would you? <laughs> <laughs> Cut them back now. We we off, we're, we're off the air. Uh, we're not quite. Right. Yeah, we're still on the air. We haven't adjourned yet. We haven't adjourned yet. Haven't adjourned yet. <laughs> I'm oh, just going to say he'd do it for 2000 Oh, there you go. He's set. <laughs> well, uh, I, I don't see any more items on the agenda. Okay. So we can declare this meeting adjourned. We're done. Thank you. You uh, run a good, quick meeting.